Good morning. Today we're going to finish out the last sermon in our series, uh, The Biblical Foundation for Relationship. And, uh, you know, I, I really love that song's written by Andrew Peterson. And um, if you read through Revelation, you see that this isn't just some made up lyric. <laughs> These are actual questions straight out of Scripture. That when the people are confronted with the glory of who God is, and they're asked, is he worthy? What's he worthy? He's received, he's worthy to receive glory and honor and power. It's just when you are confronted with who God is and all his fullness, you can't help but repeat uh, what he is worthy of. I really love that song. And uh, yeah, I've been sitting in the back the last couple weeks and up here today and uh, you know, a lot of churches have their own style of doing things, and, you know, by all means, we don't have it perfect. Uh, but one thing that's really cool is that uh, congregational singing, that, uh, that as a church body, you lift up your voices and you can, see, you can hear each other singing in the room, and that's, that's just really special and cool, and some, sometimes it get, gets lost today. Uh, we're going to be in uh, John chapter 17. And uh, there is so much in this chapter. Let me just warn you, today might be like an old-fashioned surgery. You know what you did? You just you took a leather belt and you just clamped down on it with your teeth. It might be one of those kind of days today. Uh, but I've got, some, I've got some willing victims for a, uh, for a demonstration that's going to help us uh, show something in just a little bit. So watch out for that. All right, let's read together John 17. So the context of this is that Jesus is closing out his ministry with his disciples. Uh, in fact, you could say that these literally are some of the last words that he would ever speak uh, this side of the cross. So that's, that's the, what follows right after this is Jesus being betrayed and, and handed over. So this is just right there at the very end, and this is what's important for Jesus to say. And he says this. Well, first of all, chapter 16 ends, but take, uh, in this world, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace, for in the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And chapter 17 starts like this. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested, I have made known your name to the people who you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, 
And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, for your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified in truth. I do not only ask for these, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So that's you guys. Jesus is praying for you. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and you love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also who you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. It's a a big bite of pie right there. Um, But there's a lot of really important stuff that we need to understand out of that if we're going to really understand what God's purpose for relationship is. Will you all pray with me this morning? Lord, as we have read your word, um, I pray that uh, your spirit make it clear in our heart how we need to understand, how we need to obey. I pray that you shift us from a self-centered mind to a God-centered mind and heart. I pray that you lead us away from things that distract and lead us to yourself so that we may be fulfilled. I pray that you help us to remain unified, uh, that you protect us from the evil one. Lord, I pray that that today we're able to see something about your glory uh, and that we reflect it, God. We pray all this in your name. Amen. So, uh, one of the things that you probably noticed in this passage is that there's this crazy repetitive structure. Did y'all notice that? God the Father gives to the Son, gives to the disciples, and then it comes back to God again. Uh, so can I, get, uh, can I get my volunteers, Naya, Aaliyah, Emery, David? Yes, you're, you're one of my suckers. Uh, Tyrell, come on. I need it. Come on. Cooper, you're helping, right? All right. So all of these people have assured me that they can catch a ball, okay? Except for Emery, she said sort of, so that kind of scares me. All right, so what we're going to do today, um, y'all make a little, best you can, a circle right here. All right. Dad, can you stand on the other side of that pew right there? Yeah. And uh, I need to be outside the circle, so it's Aaliyah, right? Come stand right here. And y'all spread out just a little bit. Uh, Naya right back over here. Cooper right there. All right. So you're going to start with the ball, okay? Uh, Aaliyah, right here. And face that way. Here, back up just a little bit. There you go. All right. So if y'all don't know, this is Mark, okay? And Mark is going to pick someone to pass it to that's not right next to him. So pick somebody. And you got to say, this is uh, Naya. So give it back. Sorry. Say your name when you pass it. So, all right, Naya. You want to pass? This is Tyrell over here. You got to say his name when you pass it, okay? All right. All right, Tyrell, pick somebody. This is Emery right here, Cooper. Oh, oh, this this could be rough. Uh, (laughs) All right, Emery, and you're going to pass it to uh, Leah. 
and then Aaliyah back to Mark. All right, and then start it over again and keep saying the names. Who did you pass? All right, keep going. You got to say the names loud so everybody can hear. Say it loud, Cooper. Got to pay attention. Going to get two going now. Yep, you better hurry. Pay attention. <laughs> All right, right here. All right, Cooper, got to pay attention. All right, toss it to Emory. All right. Oh, we're going for three now. Oh, wow, this is getting to be impressive. All right, let's hear the names. Keep saying the names. Wow, impressive. All right. Mark, when you get them back, just hold on to them. Keep going, Tyrell. Keep going. All right. Y'all give them a round of applause. Good job, guys. Thank you. That was it. That was it. All right. That has nothing to do with this. Just kidding. Uh, so the reason that we did that is because in this scripture, there is an amazing pattern of how God works. Do you all notice that? Uh, pick any part of it. Uh, it says, Father, glorify me with the glory that you have given me. I have glorified them, and they have known you, and they have given you glory. Do you all notice the pattern there? The Father to the Son to the disciples back to God. This is, this is the pattern of this entire scripture, and this is the pattern of generally how God works. Uh, but the key word, the word that's repeated more than anything else in this passage is glory, which I preached a terrible sermon on glory about six weeks ago because it's very hard to define. Uh, glory is a word that's very elusive to, to understand, but I think John Piper does well in this. This is what he says. He says, uh, John Piper defines this by the going public of God's infinite worth. Okay? He defines it this way by refer referring to Isaiah chapter 6. When the angels cry out, what do they say? Three things. Same word. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his, and you would expect them to say, holiness. Right? But it doesn't. The whole earth is filled with his what? With his glory. So, at this moment when God's holiness goes forth and fills the earth, it's called glory. And Jesus is asking God the Father to glorify the Son, that the Son may glorify him. So what is Jesus requesting? He's requesting that God the Father... Put the holiness of God on display for all to see in the Son, in Jesus. And what is about to happen? Jesus is about to be betrayed. He's about to be crucified. And Jesus is asking that in this moment, that, that the Father enable, give glory to the Son so that God may be really known for what he is. Consider uh, Matthew 5, cha uh, chapter 5, verse 16. It says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So in other words, who we are, what Jesus says in, early in his ministry is, who you are should reflect who God is. That when people see the way that you live your life, that should be a reflection of that person is bearing or reflecting the image of God. When you were a kid or an immature adult, which I've overcome this stage, uh, do you ever get a mirror and hold it up to a mirror and look into the infinity of mirrors, right? 
it becomes distorted eventually. You can't see forever into that mirror, can you? Uh, that's because our mirrors are imperfect reflections of even each other. Um, but as people, your dog does not, is not created in the image of God. I'm sorry, I'm about to offend someone, but there's no such thing as a grand dog, okay? And for sure, there's no such thing as a grand cat, okay? That's, that's a whole nother level of sin and crime. Uh, but all joking aside, humans are uniquely created. Of all the things in creation that God said, God created the stars, the sun, the moon. He said they're good. When he created man in his own image, he said that it is very good. Because we uniquely of creation are the ones who bear and can reflect the image of God. Not your dog, not your cat, not anything. The heavens bear witness. Everything that lives bears witness to the glory of God. But you as being created in his image bear a unique responsibility and opportunity to do that. So where is the focus of the Christian life? And what is the purpose of all of our relationships? It is for the glory of God. Uh, I know we got some, some uh, presbies in the house. Uh, and the Presbyterians do a great thing in raising their children and that they catechize them. They ask them questions about what is, what is the purpose of life and things like this. And one of, the, one of the questions of the uh, Westminster Catechism is this. What is the chief end of man? Come on, does anybody know it? Greg, you know it? <laughs> to, glor to, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is a fantastic answer. That is something that if you're not intentional about knowing about, um, what is the purpose of life? Uh, all of a sudden, it becomes very you-centered um, and not as much God-centered. So let me ask you this. Up into this part of the story, in the account in Luke, Jesus right here is praying so fervently that he is sweating drops of blood. Um, has Jesus glorified God up until this point in the story? Would you all say yes or no? Is there anything he's done that has failed to do that? No. Not only was he uh, sinless, but he was perfectly righteous as well in all that he did, all that he thought. So everything he's done so far has glorified God. He was sinless. He healed the sick. He fed thousands. He displayed miracles. Excuse me. Has taught people, uh, all pointing in one direction, that these people are pointed to who God really is. That when they encounter Jesus, they see God. Not a representative of God, but literally the God-man, God in flesh. Jesus is the perfect representation of God. And so now, why all of a sudden is he asking this? Is there more for Jesus to show? Absolutely, there is. He's at the foothills of being crucified. And I think that Jesus is asking for the holiness of God to be displayed in his crucifixion and everything leading up to this. How is it glory to be crucified naked? How is it glory to be spat on and slapped? How is it glory to have your beard torn out of your face? How is it glory to be whipped nearly to death? How is it glory to be humiliated? How is it glory to be betrayed? How is it glory to make your mother suffer through your death? In an ideal world, parents don't bury their children, right? How is it glory to be stabbed in the side with a spear when your body is already lifeless, without air, without circulation, without life? How is it glory to have a crown of thorns twisted into your brow? How is it glory to be ridiculed? How is it glory 
to have people roll dice for your clothes while you're hanging by nails, by your hands and your feet. How in the middle of all of that is God's holiness on display? John Calvin defined the glory of God as this. And I think this is a great, simple answer to what glory is. Glory is when we know what God is. Now, I've got that for those of you taking notes. Glory is when we know what God is. And I would modify that slightly. And I would say glory is when God shows us who he is. So, uh, Steve Short asked a great question this morning in equipping hour, <laughs> and it was about suffering. Um, and part of my response to suffering is that it only makes sense in the fact that we have a God that was willing to suffer, because all of us experience, suf experience suffering in life. Uh, we experience brokenness in our relationships. We experience deaths that are untimely. We experience all kinds of things that just don't make sense. And yet, none of this is God's fault. God isn't responsible for any of the death or any of the sin in the world. We brought that, not him. And so how does God show us who he is when he's being crucified naked? What does that say about him? Does it say that he's humble? Does it say that he loves you? Does it say that he was willing to go further than anyone else ever would to pay the only price that he could pay for you? Uh, think about the phrase in this story. Glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the what? Before the foundation of the earth. This was the moment in time right here that history was literally split in two. Thousands of years on this side, thousands of years on that side. And this is the moment where more clear than anyone else, being humiliated, hung, like not, not even a Roman citizen could be hung on a cross and crucified like this. And it's in that moment that God glorifies the Son. I had a professor in college who said that Jesus is glorified the most in his humiliation. You know, to, to condescend to someone is, you know, we think of that in a way as speaking down to someone. But when, when, when in fancy Bible talk, when God condescends, he comes down to where we are. And he was made lower than any of us in the room has ever been made. So what does the cross say about who God is? It, it tells us exactly who God is. And it's simply John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This was not made up on the spot. This was the plan for all eternity, that this is how he would redeem humanity and restore them into right relationship with himself. The purpose of relationship is to glorify God. To show who he is. And what does Jesus say? L let's look at verse 2 and 3. Read that again real quick. I'll, I'll just, uh, at the end of verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority all, over all flesh, to give eternal life to all you have given him. And this is how Jesus describes eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may what? Know you. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Um, you know, I've said something that, that probably some of y'all get annoyed with at some point, but I think it's a great description of why heaven is heaven. Heaven is not heaven because you are there, okay? Okay? Heaven is heaven is because, because God is there. And what is, why, why? What are we supposed to do in heaven? We're supposed to know him eternally. 
in eternity, it's hard for you to fathom because even though you may have been married close to 50 years or 30 years or 10 years or whatever, or you may have had friendships for 55 years or five years, depending on how long you live, you think you know somebody well, and you think you can exhaust most of what you know about someone. That is not true with God. There is an, an eternity that you will never cease knowing more about God. And the purpose of that is that God wants to share it with us. Over and over and over again, you think about our, our ball demonstration, you know, it's passed around. It's constantly. And Bill started off the series talking about God is community in and of himself. He was complete. Within the Trinity, there's a constant sharing. There's no lack. There's no need. But out of overflow of who God is, he shares it with us. Um, why do we share? Some of us don't. <laughs> Some of us don't like sharing at all. Um, I think the experience of life and the experience of relationship is only complete when it's shared. So make believe with me for a second. Can you all, can you all do that? All right. How many, of, how many of you here have ever been, to, uh, been in the mountains before? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have ever seen a really, really clear night where you can see more stars than you ever thought you'd see? Okay. So that's just about everybody. All right, so imagine yourself standing in the middle of a mountain meadow at midnight, okay? Mountain meadow at midnight. The skies are perfectly clear. A meteor streaks across the sky, burning neon green, incredibly hot, just so, so bright that it lights up the entire valley. You can see the snow on the peaks. You can see above the tree lines. Uh, you can see the creek running through the middle of the valley. You can see everything. For three or four seconds, it just streaks across, lights up everything. It was pitch black. Whole valley is lit up. Lasts for about three or four seconds. So you tell me, what is the level of your enjoyment of that moment if you are alone? Okay. And what is the level of the enjoyment if you are with someone? Is it different? What do you all think? Same or different? It's different, isn't it? Why? Could it be that God has created us for relationship? Could it be that only in sharing that the experience is complete, right? Usually people don't go to the Grand Canyon all by themselves, right? Even our society where people claim that they like being alone, they're, they go to Starbucks to be by themselves around other people, okay? Y'all get that? That when we don't exist in the pattern of relationships that God has given us, you are living an incomplete life. The level of enjoyment is very different all by yourself than if you're with your two best friends, right? Because you can say, wow, did you see that? What did you see? Did you see this peak over here, how it lit up with that color green that reflected the meteor? What do you do if you're by yourself? Oh, well, let me go write that down so I can tell somebody later, <laughs> right? Joy and glory is only complete when it is expressed and when it's shared with other people. And again, back to the Westminster Catechism, what is the chief end of man or what is the purpose of man? to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And you don't do that by yourself. So, um, there, this is way too much for one sermon, but <laughs> the, the purpose of relationship is to glorify God. So what are we going to do to glorify God in our, in our relationships? What are we to do if we are to live a life that fulfills the purpose of relationship? Uh, Jesus prays for some things for us, so let's, let's look at those things. Um, number one, if we are to fulfill the God-given purpose of relationship, we must be unified. Look with me at verse 11, chapter 17, verse 11. Verse 11. 
it says this. Jesus is speaking kind of in the future tense here as he, as he looks at the cross ahead of him. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and they would be in the world. Jesus would leave his disciples behind. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Jesus prays three things. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. So one of the greatest things that Jesus was concerned with was church unity. Would you believe that? Jesus is approaching the cross, and one of the things he's saying is that there could be divisions. There could be problems within a church. Would you raise your hand if you've ever experienced or witnessed anything like that? Not nobody here. Uh, unity. Where does unity come from? Well, first of all, in all these things, we should take great comfort in knowing that Jesus is praying these things on our behalf. Uh, but it comes from understanding that, you know, um, Francis Chan tells a story about someone coming up to him after church and telling him how, uh, how they didn't like the worship today. And he says, well, that's good because it's, we're not worshiping you. <laughs> and I think that's a key factor to churches being unified and healthy is the understanding that ultimately this is not about me, right? Will you all say that with me? This is not about me. Y'all get that? Do you see that? What happens in a relationship when someone is selfish? You know what happens? You lose. You've got a winner and you've got a loser. What happens is actually both of you lose. Uh, unity is very, very important. We must be unified in who God is. So that's not just doctrine about what we believe about God, but in how we're supposed to solve problems how we're supposed to address each other when we don't agree, um, all these types of things. Uh, second thing, if we are to fulfill the God-given purpose of relationship, we must be sober to spiritual warfare. Look with me at verse uh, 15. It says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Uh, another thing that was discussed this morning in equipping hour is that how some Christians have the perception of, I come to Christ and life is supposed to get better and be easier and I have no problems. I only get raises at work. Uh, I only get job opportunities that pay me more money. Wrong. Uh, the context of before all this, is Jesus saying, in this world you will have trouble. We live in a broken, messed up place. Uh, so the church is supposed to be a place of solace where there's unity, where there's love, where people take care of each other. That's what Jesus is saying first. But he's also saying that spiritual warfare is a real thing. So I thought C.S. Lewis had an uh, interesting quote that I, I thought was... Uh, pretty appropriate, probably how for most of us think of, of Satan and demons and things like that. He said, indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, the soft underfoot without any sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. And that's from his book, The Screwtape Letters. In fact, in another part of the book that I recall, he says, it's just a fiction book about spiritual warfare, but it's got some good stuff in there. It's this demon writing to another demon, and uh, he says something like, you know, don't let him know you're there. As long as he's not doing anything for the kingdom, we've got him right where we want him. <laughs> in a sedentary life in your faith, where you're not seeking other believers, where you're not seeking God, where you're just expecting things to go well, guess what? Things might go well for you in some standards, um, but it doesn't mean that the enemy is not pursuing you uh, to steal glory from God. Of the three things that Jesus requests in this story, one of them, we have to realize that one of them is that, that the Father keep us from the evil one. How often do you think about that?
and last. If we are to fulfill the God-given purpose of relationship, which is to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever, we must abandon lies for the truth. Read verse 17 with me. Verse 16 says, They are not of the world, just I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Would you all agree that it's freedom to relax and trust God? How many of you struggle with the anxiety of trying to control everything that's placed within your realm of responsibility and all the, all the things that you have to deal with in life? Does it feel like too much sometimes? Would you all agree with that? Shoot, I can't even sleep sometimes. I mean, I wake up and, you know, all the sheets are pulled off the bed because I've rolled around 30 times. Um, Freedom is to relax in God's Word. Freedom is to trust and obey. Being sanctified is God bringing you along into who He's created you to be. How do we know that? We read His Word, we trust, we obey. Knowing it doesn't do anything for you. Uh, You can know everything in your head and know nothing in your heart. You can know, I mean, I had professors in college that that taught Bible that I don't even think were Christians. Uh, And if you ask anybody who's gone to seminary, they probably have at least one that they'd say that about. That these guys are brilliant, they know the word, but man, I just, I can't say that this person was probably a believer. To put God's word into action in your life, how does that happen? Uh, Jesus says that we're to be sanctified in the truth, and that God's word is truth. How much is, of this is a part of your thinking? Uh, we have a lot of media that's very addictive. <laughs> uh, what influences your thinking more? Is it the news? Is it the stock market? Is it stupid stuff on a social media platform? What is it? What influences you? Uh, because you are being changed. Your mind is being changed by something even if it's into doing nothing. Uh, You are being influenced. You are being affected. How much are you being sanctified? How much are you being affected by God's Word? This is a request that Jesus has made as He is about to be ripped away from the people He spent three years of His life with. Who do you know There are a lot of critics in our world, right, who criticize the Bible, who criticize Christians, and some of us earn that. Um, But you know what? The critics never have better answers. They never do. Never do. So I thought, um, this is from the Just Thinking podcast, which if you're looking for something to listen to, uh, I'd recommend But these are some of the dying words of famous people, people who are influential, right? These are some of their last words. Queen Elizabeth I, all my possessions for a moment of time. Actress Joan Crawford toward her housekeeper who had begun to pray aloud for her. Damn it, don't you dare ask God to help me. Writer Jane Austen, when asked by her sister if there was anything she wanted, said, nothing but death. Queen Louise of Prussia, I am a queen, but I have not the power to move my arms. Film producer Louis B. Mayer of MGM, nothing matters. Nothing matters. Lady Nancy Astor of the Coffee Fortune, am I dying or is it my birthday? Winston Churchill, before slipping into a coma and dying uh, days later, said, I am bored with it all. Composer Ludwig von Beethoven, friends applaud, the comedy is finished. Writer Thomas Hobbes, I'm about to take my last voyage, a great leap into the dark. 
Karl Marx, when urged by his housekeeper to write down his last words so that they may be, may be kept for posterity, said, go on, get out. Last words are for fools who haven't said enough. Are these great answers? Do these people sound like at the end of their life they have completed a process, that they have completed an adventure, that they have completed a journey that has been meaningful to them? It's depressing. There's nothing to it. There's emptiness. There's irony. Uh, there's nothingness. And that's all that they have. Compare this to the Apostle Paul as he's writing uh, to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, as his time was drawing near. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, for my time of departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only me, but also to all who love his appearing. Is there a difference there? To someone who fought his whole life for church unity, I mean, he literally dealt with problems like his entire ministry. He went on adventures and he dealt with problems. He battled in spiritual warfare, and he was sanctified in the truth. Think of Jesus' last words. Do they resemble anything of these things? Cursings, emptiness, uh, pointlessness. No. Jesus prays this whole prayer. He has to answer before a council uh, put on trial. His last words were to John. Um, which I'll read them to you. It says, When Jesus saw his mother, this is as he's hanging from the cross, with the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. So he's giving his mother away to be cared for. And then he asked for a drink because he's suffocating to death as he hangs on the cross and he can't talk. He asked for a drink from a sour sponge, or a sa sour wine from a sponge. It was held up to his mouth, and he said, it is finished. What was finished? That he had glorified God, that he had shown the world in the most complete way who God was. Do you know that, God? Or do you think you know who God is? Because the clearest picture of who God is is shown to us from the suffering servant that God himself died for you, did for you what you can never do for yourself. Why? Because this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Your life is not whole. Your life is not complete. You don't understand why you're here until you understand that. Um, I think Jesus finished well. And the crucifixion wasn't the end of the story. Uh, when he rose from the dead, he broke the curse of sin and death. The fall that happened in Eden was reversed at the resurrection signifying that God has the power over sin and death. Not you, not Karl Marx, not Beethoven, not anybody else. But he wants you to know him. Do you know him? Y'all pray with me. <clears throat> Lord, your, your glory and who you are is just so, so hard for us to fathom so hard for our mind and our hearts to capture. Lord, if we have to be simple, let us be simple and just see you and see the love that you demonstrated for us that while we were still sinners, you died for us on the cross. 
Lord, help us to know you. Help us to know your glory. Father, keep us unified. Protect us from the evil one. Sanctify us by your word. And let us make you known. We pray these things in your name. Amen.